So, yeah, I'll just read out the question. To quote you from the last session, I don't really care that much about how the Federal Reserve works because it's going away really quick. So if that's true, um, who or what is going to replace things like that? Not specifically the Federal Reserve, but think of it in the abstract. Um, like things like that, those sorts of systems, what is going to replace them? And do you know groups that are actually working on those problems specifically? Well, um, we can talk about it, I think, in maybe two languages. So I'll talk about it in, um, hmm, let's way to put this. Shenanigans. All right, there we go. So there's one approach that I'm going to call shenanigans. So there are lots of shenanigans going on. That's, that's one answer to the question. Uh, you, those are folks who are in positions of power. Right? The folks in positions of power are looking at the current Federal Reserve structure and going, awesome. This looks fantastic. I see something that I can make very pliable and uh, upgrading it the kinds of things I'd like to see. And we've already seen that. Like right now, the thing that we used to call the Federal Reserve, guess what? It's gone. I don't know if you guys know, but the changes that were made in the past couple of days so radically changed the nature of that construct that it's called the Federal Reserve in name only. And those are serious shenanigans. Like that is a massive change to the underlying financial structure of this country. Um, so check, it's over. Shenanigans, done. Now there's other folks who are trying to work some shenanigans too. Um, Joel asked, what happened to the Fed? Oh, I'll just do a little brief. It doesn't take too much energy. So, uh, the Federal Reserve is very, very limited in the kinds of things it's allowed to do. By the way, its actual mandate is minuscule compared to what it's been doing recently. But most fundamentally, it can only operate through a very small number of primary lenders, these big banks, the too big to fail banks. The reason why they're too big to fail is because they're the way the Federal Reserve hits the real economy. So if they failed, the Federal Reserve would have no interface with the real economy. And it could only engage in a very small number of kinds of transactions with them. It could take uh, what we call repo actions. This is gonna get very esoteric very quick. But some period of time, not long ago, like three, four days ago, a complete restructure was put in place where a series of things that are called special purpose vehicles were created, managed by a private firm called BlackRock, which is the world's largest asset manager, and direct interface to the United States Treasury, which to the US Treasury now is able to, and on the hook for, putting treasuries, which is the, the kind of assets the Fed can uh, count as being real things, into these special, special purpose vehicles, the SPVs can then use those assets to acquire almost any kind of financial security, which is say equities, like shares in companies and what's called corporate paper, so bonds in companies, put them on the books of the special purpose vehicles and the treasury uh, assets are what's called first lot loser, which is to say that if the price, let's say an SPV buys shares in Uber and Uber goes from 40 to 20, the United States Treasury takes that loss. So what that means is that as of right now, two things have changed. One, the Treasury can now inject liquidity directly into the, into the economy at the most, almost the most fundamental level, not quite down to human beings, but we're getting there real quick. And the US Treasury is actually now more or less driving the show. They're actually on the other side of that, actually being able to pressure things. And I would be very surprised if at this point now, Secretary Mnuchin and, uh, the president are not able to actually just do the things they want to do directly to the tunes of trillions of dollars. So that's what happened to the Fed. And I would say that's a very high quality level of shenanigans. All right, now let's look on the other side. Um, yes, there are groups that are looking at what might replace it. Um, I am associated with some of these groups, have been for quite some time. Alternatives actually look like a radical devolution of authority and power from the existing institutional structures using a combination of principles to design new models. So for example, one principle is to push as much choice making authority down to the edge as possible. So UBI is a very simple example. And I don't mean UBI from the point of view of means. I mean UBI from the point of view of how do you make a functional economy? Uh, actually, you know what? let me just throw this out there. Let's see what people think about it. Um, take collective intelligence as the metaphor of the market. Uh, the market is supposed to provide a really high quality function of collective intelligence, i.e. the price function, supply and demand function is supposed to tell us stuff, a whole lot of stuff about what the very large number of people out there are perceiving as what is needful and are able to provide to that, to that need. But we have at least two major problems with our, our collective intelligence as it exists right now. 
One problem is uh, we're not getting the right kind of signal balance from the, from the nodes. You know, if, if Bill Gates has all the dollars, then our market is getting all of its signals from one node. Now he doesn't, but he has a lot of them. And every other node that may actually have real significant perception that it needs to inject into that collective intelligence, if it doesn't have the right amount of signal, then we're actually getting a very warped sense of reality. And so this, the thing that Piketty looked at, and he kind of looked at it from the point of view of injustice, I'm going to look at it from the point of view of a malfunctioning sense-making system. We're actually not getting the sense-making from our system that we're supposed to be getting because the network topology is all fucked up. All right, well, UBI is at one point, one element of that is to correct that. I need to, I must inject a, an adequate amount of signal, which in this case is money, at every node to make sure I'm actually getting signal from my entire network. If I get that, then I've actually got a network topology that is constructed so as to maximize the collective intelligence. And that just is a more effective and more powerful machine. So I don't need to have, be worrying too much about things like uh, equity and fairness, at least not first order. I just need to be worrying about what this thing's supposed to do. And then I've got another one. This other one I think is extremely powerful if people grasp it. Um, and this is very well known, but it's shocking how much economists don't take it into account. If I'm looking at, at the, the supply and demand function, we know that we have a massive uh, cliff, like a nonlinear jump in choice making at the threshold of privation. And so if I've got enough money that I can tell somebody, all right, so somebody comes to me and says, I would like you to clean the toilets in my office building. And I say, all right, well, what are you willing to offer? And they say eight bucks an hour. My response is fuck you because I've got fuck you money. That's a terrible offer. I ain't willing to do it. But there's a lot of people who can't say fuck you. And the problem is in, the, in our particular economy, if you don't have fuck you money, then you've got, oh, I'm about to get fucked money. You just have to say yes to whatever offer is made. So you got a whole lot of people who are radically being underbid. The, the price signal and the demand signal are asymmetric because of this nonlinearity and the ability to say no to an offer. So by replacing people's ability to say no to an offer, you actually reestablish the symmetry and continuity of the price and demand function. Now imagine what happens. When somebody is now sitting there who's currently being paid minimum wage to clean the toilets in J.P. Morgan's office building just says, fuck you, I'm just going to go home and plant a garden instead. Then the boys at J.P. Morgan have to figure out how they're going to get their toilets cleaned. And they got probably three choices right now. They can clean their own damn toilets, which is perfectly fine. Or they can pay a fair wage, which will probably be in the order of like $85,000. It's just how much you have to pay me to clean their toilets. And that's a, really actually what the price signal should be. That's how much value this, this actual work actually has. If the market was doing its job fairly, that's what you would see. Then you get option three. If people are paying $90,000 to get their toilets clean, guess what Elon Musk's going to be doing? Not building electric cars. He's going to be building, building toilet cleaning robots. Boom, our economy is actually doing the right stuff for the first time in a long time. All right. If you think about UBI as a mechanism for solving the problem of the fact that the collective intelligence mechanisms or markets have actually not been functioning because they haven't been designed appropriately to make sure that the signal we're getting from the price and, and demand side is actually right, then you've actually got your head on straight. If you're designing your economy and your finance around that kind of thinking, right? it's, a, it's just creating a network construct that gets the right kind of signal through the graph that people are participating in to get maximum collective intelligence, then you can design something that actually works. Yes, there are groups that are trying to do things like that on that basis. With any luck, we and or they will start releasing proposals over the next couple of weeks because the opportunity for actually doing it is pretty high right now. Um, all right, so that's some stuff. Again, I said a lot of words. I can go on forever about it, but it feels like hopping about seems to be the right thing to do here. Yeah, I think everyone needs to invest in toilet cleaning robots, I think is what the takeaway from that is. Find the dirtiest job that people don't want to do and find a way to get robots to do that first. I think it's a pretty good principle. Cool.